Mind Games Part 2 Having explained in the first part of Mind Games some of the mind games that the narcissist deploys against you, this then leads to the inevitable question of why is this done? I dare say that some of you will be tempted to answer because you're all arseholes. Whilst this is understandable and potentially accurate, at least when viewed from your perspective, and certainly when you're talking about lesser and mid-range narcissists, it's not going to provide you with any insight into the workings of the narcissistic mind and narcissistic behaviours. Accordingly, I will expand on why mind games are used so comprehensively by our kind. 1. Fuel. Obviously, and very important. The application of mind games to the dynamic between you and us is done in order to prompt an emotional reaction from you, and thus we gather fuel from you. Whether you become upset, distraught, frustrated, annoyed, or angry, as a consequence of the games that we play, it is all fuel, which we must have and we readily drink up from you. Two, alongside the fuel, of course, is our old friend control. Given that we are hypersensitive to any perceived threat to our control, we must always assert control over you. And alongside that, nullify any threat that you pose to our control. Our environment and the people in it must be beholden to us. We have to control everything around us in order to ensure that we continue to exist, to thrive, to receive the fuel that we need, to obtain those character traits and residual benefits, and remove risks to that control. By subjecting you to these mind games, we are either asserting control over you through their application, or nullifying the threat that you pose to that control as a consequence of your behaviours. The mind games allow us, in the long term also, either instinctively wear less or mid-range, or consciously wear greater or ultra, to cause you to become trapped by them, to be paralysed by their effects, as, being the truth seeker that you are, you try to establish what is happening, rather than knowing them for what they are, i.e. manipulations driven by our pursuit of the prime aims, and causing yourself to move far away from them through the imposition of no contact. 3. Future planning. Naturally, this is only applicable where the greater are the ultra. It's a common outcome from entangling with our kind that you will be smeared, labelled, character assassinated as the crazy one, once you have been disengaged from or if you have had the audacity to escape us. The mind games bring about such a state of mind in you that it becomes easy enough for us to point to your behaviour during devaluation, your behaviour post-disengagement or escape, and demonstrate that you are indeed completely batshit crazy and unhinged. There are very few people who have the mental robustness to resist the proliferation of mind games and not be adversely affected by them in some way. And there are some who are the victims of such behaviour that are left ground down, broken, mentally unwell and at the end of their tether, all of which creates the appearance of being crazy. The greater and the ultra consciously engages in these mind games to assert control in the instant, but also with a view to being able to utilise that, the engendered craziness, against you at a later juncture. The lesser and mid-range don't plan in that way. They will utilise it instinctively in the moment to control you and then, at a later stage, use the collateral consequence of your mental collapse through the provision of control in the moment to control you again at a later stage in the moment. So the distinction there is the great and the ultra use mind games against you, let's say, in January consciously, knowingly, in order to control you consciously and knowingly in January, but also with a mind to ensure that you suffer a mental collapse by June so that that can be used against you in June. The lesser and mid-range narcissist uses mind games against you in January to control you in January and isn't thinking about what comes down the line. However, 
if you have a, a mental collapse in June, then that mental collapse in June will be used by the lesser and mid-range narcissist against you in June. Number four, facade management. By engaging in games where we are in control, you are invariably made to be seen to be histrionic and volatile. In contrast, we are calm and pleasant to everybody, except you, and this causes people to form an adverse view about you. And this, where mid-range, greater or ultra, allows the maintenance of the facade. We also will utilise the lieutenants and members of our coterie, who all regard us as decent and kind, which then makes your life even harder in terms of trying to persuade people that you're not crazy, and actually, we are the crazy ones. 5. Superiority Reinforcement We operate from the perspective that we are superior to everybody around us, and especially you, as the where you hold the position of intimate partner primary source. This is part of the assertion of control, and by engaging in games where we're able to pull the strings, make you upset and angry, and control you in this way, this allows us to emphasise that we are indeed superior to you. We are the controllers, you are weak, and therefore that enables us to keep control over you. 6. Self-defence Many of the mind games that we engage in are because we need to defend ourselves from being challenged, criticised, i.e. our control being threatened. Accordingly, when we project, deny, deflect and blame shift, although there may be a collateral benefit in terms of how it affects you, the primary reason for engaging in these behaviours is to defend ourselves against the perceived threat to our control. So we do so by rejecting blame, preventing your challenge, avoiding your questioning, deflecting the criticism. 7. The creation of exhaustion. Similar to the situation with regard to future planning and causing you to be crazy, exhaustion means that in any situation you respond to a situation more effectively where you are rested and able to think in a clear manner, utilising logic rather than emotional thinking. The deployment of mind games causes you eventually to be worn down and exhausted, which results in you lacking clarity, experiencing a reduced resistance and a diminished willpower. Again, understand, the greater and the ultra purposely bring this about, the lesser and mid-range benefit from this as a collateral consequence of the mind games in the moment. Accordingly, by creating exhaustion in you, you're far less likely to be able to try to escape what we are doing, far more likely to realise what's going on, and more likely to accept the assertion of control. Number eight, plausible deniability. By operating within the vestiges of the spoken, gestures and actions, we are able to maintain vagueness and be amorphous. This allows us to manipulate to a further degree, but also serves an incredibly useful purpose in rejecting any threat to our control by suggesting that we have engaged in such behaviours to begin with, especially with regard to a third party. If we are challenged, for example, by somebody in authority, a doctor, we can, appoint to, we can point to the absence of proof or turn it into the word of someone calm and reasonable using the uh, facade so that in those circumstances we show you as the frazzled, ranting, hysterical, crazy person and we can't be the one that's caused the problem because look, we're cool as a cucumber. Nine, impact. The impact of emotional and psychological abuse is invariably more difficult for the victim to handle than physical abuse. Whilst physical abuse is understandably unpleasant for the victim, the insidious nature of mind games means that it's harder for the victim to grasp what is happening. They can't ascertain precisely what's going on. If you've broken a leg, you've broken a leg and you can see that. If you've been punched, your jaw is broken and you can see that. But where you suffer the steady erosion of your mental state through the application of spoken mind games, that becomes more difficult for you to grasp and has a more devastating impact. You might have heard victim state, I'd have preferred to actually have been physically assaulted than be put through the mental torture. For someone to actually choose physical injury over this underlines just how devastating the impact is. 10. Lack of detectability. This sits alongside plausible deniability. The fact is a bruise is a bruise, and therefore can lead to questions being asked. It's far harder 
for people to interfere and determine the effect of the mind games. Yes, somebody may present as exhausted, anxious, hypervigilant, terrified and so forth. But there's always the potential for us to suggest that it's exaggerated, linked to something else. That, indeed, it's fabricated. Fingertip bruising is fingertip bruising. You can't suggest that that was occurred as a consequence of somebody falling down. However, whilst it's harder to evade detectability with physical abuse, although not impossible, mind games make it far harder for detectability and accountability to come to visit us and therefore enables us to control you by keeping it hidden from other parties who might otherwise interfere. 11. Erosion. If you suffer a broken arm, you can still function. You can use your other arm, you can walk places, talk, you can hear and see and so forth. The mind games, of course, affect that which controls everything that you do. By wearing down your mind, we are able to grind down everything about you, causing your resistance to weaken and preventing you from functioning in a manner which might aid your escape from us. 12. Tenderizing. The application of mind games through achieving erosion and exhaustion, as described earlier, means that in effect you're being tenderized for future manipulations to be applied against you with maximum effect and far easier. Think of it in a way like carpet bombing the enemy into submission before invading them. It's far easier to conquer them once they have been bombed into submission. Again, this is done consciously and in a planned and aware manner by Greater or Ultra. It is a collateral consequence of the application of the mind games for the lesser and mid-range narcissist. 14. The creation of Endeavour. Rather, 13. Creation of Endeavour. Some of the mind games end up making you try harder to please us and do things for us, with the additional benefit which naturally arises from this through the provision of fuel, the assertion of control and residual benefits. 14. Empathic vulnerability. As a person who has empathic traits, and thus the reason why you were targeted by us, you are more susceptible to these kinds of behaviours. Mind games work especially well against you as a consequence of your empathic traits of honesty, decency, truth seeker, compassion. 15. Power. This is applicable to the greater and ultra only, as the lesser and mid-range are not aware of the true extent of the application of mind games. The greater and the ultra revel in being able to treat somebody in this manner, distort their world, have them jumping and moving at our say-so, causing them to fountain with fuel to puppeteer them in such a way without leaving physical mark, and to do so in circumstances where the individual has no idea how or why this is being done to them. The manipulation through mind games means this appeals to the sadistic nature of greaters and the ultra and underlines the omnipotence by which we operate. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening. <laughs>